Good morning, everybody, uh, to our final day of the Onto Commons Horizontal Workshop. It has been an extremely exciting week uh, with huge amount of inspiration and a uh, uh, great many discussion topics. And we are uh, going to start our final day uh, with uh, 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 several sessions, first with an excellent keynote, which I will introduce in a moment. And then if Luigi can uh, share the um, updated agenda, we can uh, show what the sessions uh, after the keynote are going to be. Um, so we have uh, one on ontology engineering in material science, which will start at uh, uh, 10.50. And then we have uh, use cases for innovative ontology applications where we will address the innovation in Onto Commons. Uh, after that, we have an updated uh, poster session. Uh, so we have a coffee break after our sessions. And at 12.40, uh, we will start with a session summary. And at 12.55, we will, f um, we will um, end with a poster session by Cosmos Alexopoulos from the University of Patras. Um, during our upcoming uh, keynote and also during our sessions, we very much encourage you to put your questions into the Q&A channel uh, under the Q&A tab, which you will see on your screen. Uh, and of course, those questions will be picked up as the discussion progresses. Um, I am really thrilled, however, to uh, introduce this final day, which is, uh, of course, very much uh, working towards innovation and application areas um, for ontologies. Um, I'm uh, very pleased to introduce the lead ontologist for inter-IKEA systems. This is all of the IKEA uh, distribution systems worldwide, uh, Katarina Kari. Uh, Katarina is a Master of Science and Engineering from Alta University and also a Master of Music Arts Management from the Sibelius Academy uh, in Helsinki. Um, she is uh, someone who specialized, has specialized in semantic web for a very long time. Um, she has created her first ontologies more than 10 years ago and she will uh, be able to tell you more about that. Um, but also, uh, she is really very much a specialist in creating knowledge graphs and her experience uh, has been really in creating knowledge graphs that service literally thousands of consumers. So this is a very, very interesting uh, use case for us uh, and a, a very, very large application area, which we can only encourage uh, further to be using ontologies. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, um, I pass the word over to Katharina Nieberg Kari. Thank you, Michaela, and um, good morning to everyone. Um, it's really, yes, um, thousands of customers, but actually, I, I dare to say, even mil millions of customers. Um, before IKEA, for the past five and a half years, um, I was also part of the team developing the fashion knowledge graph plus a few other enterprise knowledge graphs for Zalando, which is Europe's leading fashion e-commerce site. But um, today I'm here to talk, you, talk to you about enterprise knowledge graphs and how they drive innovation. Let me just give me a minute, I'll, I'll draw up my slides um, for your benefit. Um, so the topic really is, uh, First of all, about our enterprise knowledge graphs, how are they built inside an, an, an inside a company, how they lead um, innovation in it. Um, so the first thing I would like to put out here in the room and, and uh, for us to take a moment to think about is how is knowledge transferred in an organization? So if you think about an organization, uh, what's really important is um, that the knowledge flows, any kind of you know, any kind of innovation that needs to happen, um, uh, you need uh, for knowledge to be transferred uh, to change um, change from one person to another. And so, how is this done? Um, there are a few ways to think about it. Um, one is along two axes of um, and some the source being an implicit source or an explicit source. 
and then the receiver to be um, receiving it, um, the information implicitly or for the receiver to be uh, receiving the information, the knowledge explicitly. Um, and if we think about an, an implicit source to implicit receiver, this would be very much like a master and apprentice relationship where um, basically a master is just doing implicitly things and from here and there showing, showing by example, and, and the apprentice for a very long time needs to be following everything the master is doing. And so slowly, um, like a mushroom, but uh, in a quite unconscious way, um, getting all of that knowledge. And that's an example of implicit Im to implicit knowledge exchange. Um, but on the other hand, when um, there's an implicit source and, and the, outcome is, uh, the outcome is explicit, that will be um, the... Uh, equal to writing a book. Um, so everyone here, um, as most of you come from the academic world or anyone's written probably something in their lifetime, you know that uh, the ideas are in your mind and there's actually quite a lot of effort that needs to be done in order um, to put um, all the thoughts into explicit formulation, such as an article or a book. Uh, likewise, um, when the source is the, uh, the when the source is explicit, um, and the starting point is explicit, but but it becomes implicit knowledge. That's usually when you read something. So when you read something, and then an internalization and understanding, a reflection on the words in connection to what you already know is happening internally. That's when. Um, explicit knowledge is transferred into a, in an implicit um, form. And then um, the only place really where explicit receiving to uh, from an explicit source is, is happening at its purest is in something like application interfaces when computers are talking to each other. Um, but you could also say that, for example, memorizing something like memorizing something very explicitly um, like you would do in a school for a vocabulary or something, or all the, I don't know, capitals of the world, that might also be a bit of an explicit to explicit um, process of, of transferring knowledge. However, um, in the human's mind, that explicit memorization also then um, is attached to a lot of implicit knowledge so it's not like purely explicit to explicit as such. But this is kind of really good to understand. And what does all of this have to do with enterprise knowledge management? Well, um, all of the communication and knowledge transfer and exchange in an enterprise is really happening between humans through mediated computer or other services, um, texts and files, etc., And that means that all of the knowledge in an organization is happening on the axis of writing a book, reading a book. And I think that's really important for us. I want to set the stage with this thought because this is where enterprise knowledge graphs kick in. So building an enterprise knowledge graph, EKG, is a big challenge to an organization. Having seen it now through three times already and embarking on a fourth one at IKEA personally, um, what uh, my experience is that um, the organization might for the first time, and it's usually always like this, have to explicitly define all the entities in their enterprise. So to some extent, some have been explicitly defined, but especially working with the fashion knowledge graph at Zalando, um, we, we knew kind of the, the outline of all the products, if it's a dress or if it's a shoe or if it's a high heel shoe, all of that information was in a way explicitly defined already. Um, but everything around it, such as on what is this worn to the occasions and, and, and then who is in charge of this information. All of that was kind of implicitly known, 
by most, especially the fashion context that's implicitly known by the domain experts of buyers and so on, but, but it wasn't really made explicit. And the knowledge graph, since it is a shared explicit conceptualization, demands for the organization to be really explicit on all the things it needs to map in an organization. And that is um, not a technical challenge, that is an organizational, psychological communication challenge. And then building the EKG is just a technical task. And I might even argue that um, building a knowledge graph for an enterprise, I still need to measure it, but I'm coming to the hypothesis the assumption, the, the bold suggestion that 10% of that is working with RDF and doing the actual knowledge modeling. 90% of it is getting the organization to agree and governance and setting it up and knowing exactly what the features are and developing a strategy with which pace the uh, enterprise knowledge graph is being developed. So this is the second point I want to, you to understand is that while we've gone far in terms of ontology designs and RDF and OWL, and now we also have the label property graph space, and that's interesting. And it's really great that we already start having a, a really nice uh, selection of vendors with different infrastructure. The challenge of an enterprise does not necessarily lie in ontology design. That's kind of clear. That's always a happy moment when one gets to do that. But all of the other, the other problems, they lay, they lie elsewhere. So let's talk a little bit about skills needed to uh, create an enterprise knowledge graph. Um, this is something especially organizations that are starting up to build an enterprise knowledge graph, um, their question really is like, how should I staff? How should I staff this? What are the roles and skills that I'm, I'm needing to, to build an enterprise knowledge graph? And I think if we, uh, like on a large scale, I see onto commons as like a, almost like a enterprise of its own, if you want, like somebody trying, some with a purpose trying to kind of bring all these industries together. So I think it makes sense to also reflect in terms of on the commons, what kind of skills and roles would be needed to, to make it work. The skills are lie in software development, DevOps, in ontology design, data science, domain knowledge and product. So product management. And product is all about how to serve it to the customer and have the customers, the, the end users voice in, in the whole process. And the roles to that is um, when you compare, combine software development, ontology knowledge um, of skills, you have the knowledge engineer. When you combine data science and ontology skills, you have the knowledge scientist. So this is someone who would work with the data and transform it into an ontology, ontology form. Um, then if you combine domain knowledge and ontology design, I think that's really where an ontology should be more or less. Um, I mean, an ontology always needs to double in the domain knowledge. And if they're really good at it, they um, probably are more successful in their work. That's at least my experience. Um, if you combine software development, data science, you have data engineering, um, very important part about creating data pipelines, creating transformations, and actually um, getting, for example, data graphs about. Then you have, um, if you are like combine the skills of ontology and DevOps, you're in a very interesting field called SEMOPS, which is all about serving the ontology, versioning it, making it available. And um, I think like a year ago, I had a talk about SEMOPS, how uh, we used to do it at Zalando, for example. And I think it's one of the like really exciting, exciting um, development areas of um, really maintaining ontologies um, and serving, making them available and serving them. If you con combine domain knowledge and product management, you get a product manager. I mean, product managers also, like the ontologists, cannot work without 
some domain knowledge. And then purely software development skills um, would be the back end role, which um, is also very important uh, for um, building an enterprise knowledge graphs. So all these roles more or less you need of, and then how you stuff, how much of what you need um, is really depends on the organization and where they want to go to. Now, what is the level of service that an enterprise knowledge graph needs to have? Because just, you know, creating the ontology and, I don't know, just having the RDF file up does not cut it. There's, there's a la service layer that needs to happen on top of it to make it um, available to the company. RDF is still not well spread. It most likely will never be that well spread. It's, um, it needs to transfer into other types of um, types of presentation forms. I mean, I'm not saying RDF is going away. No, RDF is at the core of, of enterprise knowledge graph. It's one thing that makes it tick. It's like a very good framework for developing enterprise knowledge graphs. However, on top of that, in order to serve the enterprise knowledge graph to the organization, there needs to be a layer of service, um, a service layer on top of it. And let's have a look at that. So what are the internal um, enterprise knowledge graph products that um, need to be in place? Um, and and if, if we're thinking about the enterprise knowledge graph team um, or the organization in, inside the organization, so, so a team inside the organization, what they actually need to do is um, they need to build all of this in order to, to service this. And what are they? They are APIs. And that means they're, they're actually no customer facing applications that this enterprise knowledge graph team is driving. And this is very important for vendors because sometimes there are vendors who are like saying, oh, we have this application for your enterprise knowledge graph and this is how you can power search with it. But when you have a really large company, there's a team already owning search. And, and it means that this, um, there needs to be this separation of labor in a large organization. That's just the physics of a large organization. So you will most likely, another team will be responsible for search and they will hold on to it and it's their right. And then the only way the enterprise knowledge graph can and help, for example, the search team is by offering them API that will give um, the right knowledge at the right time with the right performance. So as such, the enterprise knowledge graph team, how it's positioned in the organization is it is an infrastructure team. And when an enterprise embarks on knowledge graphs, they need to realize that they're building an infrastructure for knowledge where data and knowledge are first class citizens. So those are all the arguments and, and the positioning that an enterprise knowledge graph team needs to take. And the products are APIs to, to serve it to, to other um, internal teams then going, which are customer facing. Um, another one is URIs to URLs. Um, I would, that I would argue that is like one of the most important ones because developers who are, you know, trying things out with the identifiers, if they can just put that in a browser and look at it, they will understand the triple structures much better. I've had that those comments before of, of at Zalando, there was a entirely new, so Zalando, what Zalando does is it has hackathons from time to time. And there was this like team in that hackathon I didn't know about them at all. I was like working on some other thing and they used uh, what we built for the fashion knowledge graph and especially the documentation page, which was ultimately your eyes to your URLs page. So each, each um, concept in the fashion knowledge graph um, was a web page or um, so resolved into a web page. And they looked at that and they found that was really useful for them to build a, um, a mock-up, a quick, quick, uh, put together um, demo on on when they were uh, on a new customer facing application where they used the knowledge graph, 
Um, another, the third uh, important thing for internal EKG products is visualization. So this is especially for domain experts, business people, non-technical people to intuitively understand the knowledge graph. And most of the time I see I see people getting really excited about the knowledge graph when they see the visualization. And I heard from Michaela that this has kind of been a repeating, repeating theme, a theme this week, that visualization is really important. So um, I have a few more messages about that coming just um, soon. And then I would argue that a Sparkle editor is also important. I mean, that will not have a huge reach inside an enterprise because again, Sparkle knowledge is is only for the few. But for example, my own experience is uh, working with Wikidata, um, their Sparkle endpoint, the Sparkle editor is fantastic. I can, like they have like this visual endpoint, like a, just a UI to, to do Sparkle queries. And it also has really nice information about, you know, when I write a code that it will immediately show me what that entity is all about. So I can have a preview of that entity. So a very helpful Sparkle editor. And that I think is also very important for a few um, semantic minded data engineers or uh, other ontologists working with the EKG. And let's have a look of um, what they then are used and how they drive innovation. So this layer of service, which is manifested in these four types of applications, ultimately allows for the enterprise to be innovative and to come up with new customer facing applications or new solutions and, and really reuse the discover and reuse the knowledge. And I've seen it firsthand happening. That's why I'm so confident in telling you today that if you have APIs, they allow for quick prototyping. Not only do they allow for performance um, serving of the knowledge to applications and having like a distributed architecture of uh, microservices, but they also allow for quick prototyping, which is important for innovation. And uh, they allow for discovery, which URIs URLs also allow and visualization as well. Uh, URIs URLs also is very important for lookup. You need that when you are um, just kind of tr trying something out and you need to quickly see what it is. Um, then then uh, visualization is really good uh, uh, for browsing the knowledge as well as Sparkle editors for browsing in. And Sparkle editors especially come in very handy when uh, wanting to ideate new services because then basically you can mock up a new API um, endpoint configuration uh, with a um, bit of like a new Sparkle editor uh, with a bit of a new Sparkle query. And, and the question I get a lot when building these internal EKG products is, could I visually edit the graph? And I see that capability. I mean, to some extent, some vendors are already offering it. But there's a lot that needs to be there. There's like needs to be governance put into place for that as well to really work. But if, if we can offer a product that allows for anyone to edit the graph visually, that will drive the democratization of knowledge creation in the company. And I would argue that would accelerate um, making all of the knowledge in the company company explicit because then you can start have you can start having a crowdsource authorship on that knowledge. Like just imagine there's one team writing your book, remember from implicit to explicit. There's just one team responsible for writing the book. Imagine you have the whole organization contributing to writing the book or writing many books or writing a lot of articles. And obviously there are governance issues that they need to be solved there as well. But ultimately that's the future of enterprise knowledge graph is when it's um, part of the day-to-day -day work to also be contributing to the knowledge graph. And I think it best is done through editing the graph visually. So I already previously uh, discussed uh, driving customer facing applications. And um, I just want to discuss a few that an enterprise knowledge graph traditionally would be driving. Um, so again, I said 
the the enterprise knowledge craft team will not be um, themselves responsible for these customer facing applications rather they will provide the teams responsible for these an API endpoint to, to get the knowledge and improve their CFAs. And um, one of those is search term disambiguation. So um, something we worked at uh, Zalando uh, quite a lot. And um, I think I've talked about it a few, a few times in a few conferences. And there's a blog post that, that we wrote about it as well um, a few years back. But basically something like winter was really poorly understood by Salano's um, search engine, because basically for fashion, half of the assortment is of the autumn winter season. And then we came in and, and noticed that the computer just doesn't know that winter means warm padded clothing. And that information of warm padding does exist in the product data of Salando. So the knowledge graph the fashion knowledge graph just combine that information. You know, when a customer comes in with winter, they're looking for warm padded clothes. And then when we put that little bit of semantics there, it went a long way. As Jim Hender says, according, uh, paraphrasing Jim Hender, um, the idea is with just a few things, you can correct a lot of things. And I mean, winter is such a popular search term that that correction really touched a lot of customers thousands, maybe maybe a million, but a lot of customers. Then browsing guidance. So um, for example, for recommendations, you can give them context, be like, okay, you're looking at a blazer. Well, here are other um, pieces of clothing that uh, you might be interested um, for in, in the context of business. So the knowledge graph notice that the blazer is part of the business attire or like part of business context. And then we could drive other um, recommendations that were personalized um, from that business context. So business was like that concept from the knowledge graph and that was creating this clue um, and giving that guidance to customers why they're seeing particular things. And then info box, I think you know this all from um, Google, when you search something and um, the Google's knowledge graph picks it up, it creates an info box on, on the right um, where you then have all that information. So those are like three examples um, of customer facing applications that are driven by an EKG. And, and then the question is like, and I would like to kind of now explore a little few topics in there. So Search term disambiguation, what's the role of EKG here is to understand and dissolve customer ambiguity. Like customers are using inexact words, words that the machine doesn't actually understand. Um, they can have like very different kind of meanings in them. They, they can mean something that is in, in like the professional world, like has a different word. For example, they can use bum back or um, belt back or these kind of ambiguous words that you you know needs to kind of transfer to to something exact um then in search term disambiguation or browsing guidance is also the cultural meaning and this culture meaning is not just not just about like winter um in finland means very very warm padded clothes with down uh, feathers hopefully or <laughs> to to the best effect uh, whereas in Italy, winter would mean um, woolen mini skirts to, to kind of have that Max Mara style. So that's one culture aspect um, that needs to be happening, in, in that needs to be driven from the EKG. But another one is beach uh, to male customers and beach to female customers. So for female customers, most of the time, not all, but most of the time, um, it's all about uh, flowy um, fashion attire that you kind of wear to the beach. Whereas to most male customers, it's all about sports that you can do on beach. Um, and then Infobox, um, the, the, like the, what, what an Infobox is as such, like per definition is, is a formal definition, like formal um, thing. It, there's a certain sense of authority in it. It needs to be like facts. And so the aspect of trust comes in and that's also something that then EKG can drive. Um, so for the customer ambiguity and culture meaning, 
what ontologies allow us is to capture um, it depends network. So if you ask an expert, you know, are my customers coming in with beach? What should I uh, offer them? The expert will be like, well, it depends. I mean, who are they and where are they browsing from? And do you know a little bit more? And that, that's really weird for, you know, a traditional relational database system. It really cannot house this, this ambiguity, but knowledge graph can. And an ontology is designed um, to do that, it's designed to do, understand to at least house different interpretations for um, ambiguous situations. So in a way, it's like an expert saying, "Well, it depends," and likewise for culture meaning. But what about trust? So, I think this is where reusing external ontologies come in for an enterprise. Um, like external, well-defined from authoritative sources, such as the EU, um, they can lend the enterprise trustworthiness. So for customer-facing applications and external vocabulary on global topics, such as sustainability, can give the enterprise more trustworthiness. And I think this is also, if I previously said, um, there are certain roles and skills that need to be considered for undercommons. My next point that I want you to take away is um, undercommons can give an enterprise such as Land or Ikea, it can lend them trustworthiness. But then the other, other aspect of trust is between the enterprise and then the organization and the, this like author, authority. How can we use it? How can we use your external ontologies? Um, when integrating ontology, we need to know how often does it change? And if it changes, what is the change? Because we don't necessarily want to download the whole thing. It might be too big. So if we can just get the Delta, uh, it would work. Um, how can we access this? Is there an API? Do we need to download an RDF, a Sparkle endpoint? Um, what about the immutability of your eyes um, and versioning? Do you, do you provide versioning? Do you, uh, can we trust that your eyes don't ever change? And then the enterprise also needs to trust that the ontology is maintained and it is of quality. So that's the other aspect of trust. And that is about how trustworthy the authority is in, in serving the ontology. And what I want to end this um, talk with is really my main message, which is a question. What is the level of service of undercommons? What roles and um, skills do you currently have? What is your customer promise to us industries using onto commons. And if we can solve these, if we can answer these questions, if we can come together and, and really talk about that, then I think we're set for success in terms of innovation in you and especially in EU industries. Because we'll take that power of what the EU has. I mean, I'm a, I'm a EU child, 100%. I was even born in Brussels. I'm Finnish, but I was born in Brussels, so I'm a EU citizen and I'm a proud one. And I think what's really strong with the EU is the consensus part, being a Scandinavian or being a North European um, and also the regulations, the putting things explicitly. And I think that's the strength we can have in on to commons as well, that yes, it takes us a little bit more time to come with these, but when we do, when we have defined these things and we share them and we share them in a, in a serviced way, then we're ready to go and we'll fly. And we'll do, we'll have innovation and we'll um, come together and work together. Um, even though we have different backgrounds, we, we somehow find the common language or at least a common, common way to create understanding. So thank you so much. And thank you, Michaela, for um, inviting me to speak here. 
it was a pleasure. I look forward to any questions um, that might be coming. I haven't really, I don't know what's happening in the Q&A box. So let's just take some questions, right? Thank you so much, Katharina. This has been absolutely fascinating and so many questions have actually been raised also by yourself, which I think we can also pick up on um, in our panel session uh, where you will be joining us to discuss uh, the uh, innovation direction for ontologies and onto commons. Uh, indeed, also the commons and you mentioned very importantly consensus which I believe that Simon Grant, who has posted the question in Q&A, would very much uh, pick up on. So uh, given that 90% of the challenge is in the enterprise, what is the difference between a traditional hierarchical enterprise and one that is in reality non-hierarchical or cooperative or collaborative? So quite a, a difficult question, I suppose. Yes, indeed. Um... That's a very good question. Um, I would say that there is um, good in both. So if we have this um, traditional hierarchical enterprise, um, it will take time to get started with the enterprise knowledge graph. So it will get time, <laughs> take time to just get permission for it and just to get everyone on board to align, to get one VP high up to, uh, and to uh, approve it, approve the budget. Then you need to um, basically bedazzle and, and get it on the entire middle management on board. Um, and and so on, but then but then once you've done that, once you kind of clear through the all the management layers, you're good to go because then you have all the budget, you have all the support, and then you just tell people what to do. <laughs> in in the worst case, I mean, most organizations are a mix of both. Like most organizations are moving from hierarchical to to more cooperative, um, or have elements of it. I mean, nothing is like purely hierarchical and purely cooperative. But that that will be like the challenge and and then the 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 also the um the blessing that once you do have green light you can go ahead. But uh, the the problem really is you cannot even experiment. You cannot get something like I actually I went a little bit against it and and Zalando I um I pushed for releasing an API for a certain knowledge graph just without having signed off that somebody would be using the API. And then from top of the management, they said, you know what? We're going to put all of this in a hole for two years. And they can just kill it like that. And then I was like, okay, I cannot continue working on this. Although in a way, below middle management, I had a lot of people who said that would be very useful if we would have that API. So that's the problem with these hierarchical ones. And then if we have um, um, these non-hierarchical, cooperative and collaborative ones, um, you get started really quickly. But the thing is, it becomes a market, like those kind of organizations are anyway a marketplace. And it means you basically need to be an entrepreneur who is marketing it to all parts of the organization. So you basically just need to do your marketing and sales, basically to sell it to everyone, but you can already get started. Um, and the best, best thing is if you have these kind of organizations, like new kinds of organizations, such as in the gaming world, you have in Finland Supercell, where basically a team just decides what they do. And if you would have this kind of support that, you know, you get a salary, you don't have to worry about mortgage and those kind of things, you just come to work and you work on your knowledge graph. Um, and obviously you don't work on it too long because then your teammates decide we're going to kill it, which is also very good. But you can work on it in peace and then you do your sales. But then that means, yeah, I mean, both are about selling. One is selling to management. The other one is selling to your peers. Um, so in the end, you're basically 90% of the time selling your thing and then 10% doing the modeling. I think, I think Simon is going to have a lot to say about the idea of selling to your peers because he has specialized his whole career in, in, the, in the area of consensus, but we'll come to that in the panel. Um, but I have another question uh, and we have another five minutes, which is great, uh, which is from uh, Arkopal uh, Sarkar. How could we encourage traditional standard organizations to adopt or endorse ontology for enterprise use, is it a viable option for more corporate adoption of ontology? Well, I mean, IKEA is quite a big corporate. Mm -hmm. So, and 
most of the ontology um, work that I've seen do happen actually in big corporations um, and, and even in like the traditional ones, because they're like, oh, digitalization, we need to get on with digitalization. <laughs> <laughs> and and then they're like, oh, there are this thing, the newest thing is knowledge graph. So actually, when you have co- like really traditional corporates that are a little, little bit behind, they will pick up what is the current state of art. And as we as knowledge graphs are now at the like the top of the Gardner's hype curve, and it, it would be knowledge graphs that they're picking up. So um, I think currently, like the chances are actually quite big because there are more and more examples happening, and ultimately. Um, you need you need the experience and and that like hierarchical selling to management thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are a lot of like I know at least McKinsey and Accenture, all these big consultant companies that are consulting management. They are now if they talk about data, they are talking about knowledge graphs. Yeah. Well, this 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 kind of helps us, I suppose, yeah. in yeah. this domain. So uh, Silvana Muschella, um, uh, Muschella uh, uh, links to Arco Powell's question, uh, says, um, and also linking to the ontology standardization session this week, which we had, which we had uh, uh, earlier this week. Um, one of the takeaways is to try and adopt smart standards as much as possible that respond to market needs and get these accepted by SDOs and discussed in SDO, um, uh, basically working groups. And what does TC stand for? Someone help me. I've 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 lost the, I've, I'm lost in acronyms. Oh, as yeah, always it's with the European SDO. sessions. <laughs> What's an SDO? Um, it's technical committees. Thank you, Luigi. Yeah, <laughs> I, too What's many an acronyms. SDO? Technical con- committees and working groups. Right. Um, so uh, I don't suspect that you have had uh, much interaction with those because they are they tend to be kind of the domain, sp- uh, kind of a specialist domain within a large organization. There will be people devoted. Do you uh, devote to attending those sessions and to being part of the mm-hmm. sessions do you actually i mean early days perhaps but do you interact with the standardization stakeholders standards oh. developing organizations silvana uh, disambiguates right that's what an sdo is um there you go to be honest no yeah and this is interesting I- isn't it Yeah, I, I has it, haven't wasn't aware of any at Zalando. IKEA, I'm still so I just started at IKEA. I think it it is ahead of me. I know since you know being a Finn, all my relatives worked at Nokia at some point. So I know Nokia had those and I knew how like that was that interaction happened, but it mostly happened in the research community. My mom was a research fellow at Nokia and it happened like there. But I don't know. And, and I knew that like some some of that research work then was kind of working together with engineering teams, having had a brother-in-law in engineering. So, but I, I haven't seen it myself. Um, most of my enterprise knowledge graph work is all about um, creating better customer Yes, of course. You're on the, at the user end, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah. So Silvana says this is indeed so crucial that we have to change this and make sure that the, uh, those users can penetrate these groups for the reasons that you have you have uh, uh, so eloquently uh, articulated. So uh, uh, we are now at the end of this session, but actually there are some more questions uh, that we have for you for the panel session. And uh, we will now go over to the sessions. I believe that in this particular agenda today, there is no coffee break after the keynote as it has been Uh, in the past few days. So please stay with us because we will be switching over directly. So um, if you wish to continue chatting uh, with Katarina and uh, with our other panelists, please join the uh, use cases for innovative ontology applications, but we will be discussing some of these issues further. And then in parallel, we have, of course, especially for those interested in material science, which has been really very much in terms of research, 
dominating the ontology uh, uh, development and and very much at the forefront, uh, a state of the art of, of ontology development, uh, then join ontology engineering in material science, which is in room two. Uh, so on that note, I will close the uh, keynote session and then I believe that we will be guided by Luigi over to, uh, to our um, panel session uh, room. Thank you so much and uh, a big round of applause uh, for, for Katarina. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michaela. <laughs>